it's time to talk about the quadrants. Now, the quadrants is a simple little attempt on my part to clarify one of the most confusing things in strength and conditioning. Um, sometimes I'll go online and I'll read, someone says, who's a strength coach? Well, I just don't understand it. And then I'll realize, I'll think about who they coach. And it's like, well, it makes sense because you coach them, but you don't coach these people. So really, what I want to talk about right now is the impact of a strength coach, which is far different than a lot of other questions. Um, I always use this quote, and it's, it's probably not appropriate anymore, but very often we'll work with athletes and they want to, the joke is, they want to look like Tarzan and yet they play like Jane. Though in my home, you, you should be a little afraid of Jane. So it all goes back to a question that came up from my friend Pavel years ago. What's the role of the strength coach? Um, I include this picture here because uh, I'm the guy uh, with his arms crossed. Um, every so often when people ask me, uh, why did I become a strength coach? I think, well, because I love strength. I love conditioning. But what's the role of the strength coach? Well, you know, that's pretty darn easy. The role of the strength coach is to make people stronger. And if all I do is make people stronger, then I've done my job. There's a little problem with that, right? So the role of the strength coach, and I answer it very simply here, is to make people stronger. Well, that's true, but Pavel followed up with a very important question. What's the impact of the strength coach? Ah, now the impact is different because, you know, we can be the strongest team around and still lose every game in certain sports. The correct answer in the beginning was, of course, it depends. Anytime you say it depends means you're doing okay, you're on the journey to clarity. So as I begin to work on this idea, all of a sudden certain things begin to open up in my head. Now, if you have a good strength coach and you're a deadlifter and your deadlift gets to a certain number, things are working. A good powerlifting strength coach can give you some ideas, some training programs, uh, some tricks, some hints. That'll increase, increase your deadlift. Uh, when CrossFit first came out, there was a promise made online that within two years, they could get people up to a 715-pound deadlift by simply doing things like push-ups, pull-ups, and those kinds of things. Well, all of us in weightlifting were like, there's a program that by doing basic calisthenics, uh, at the time, swimming was still involved, running, um, uh, burpee challenges, all kinds of things. By doing that, you could get a strength level of 750 pounds. Well, of course, we were all in. And the problem is, I'm not sure that actually happened. I have an interesting thing here called the, uh, the shot put versus the discus. You know, it's interesting in, in the shot put, uh, my friend, the late Brian Oldfield, told me one time that once he figured out his technique in the shot put, he could use increases in the weight room to predict how far he would throw in the shot. Whereas in the discus, once you hit certain levels of strength, you are strong enough and adding to your strength doesn't correlate like that. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, <laughs> the last one here of... One of the most difficult sports for a strength and conditioning coach to understand their impact is American football. And I, I imagine rugby when this it would be in the same. It's 11 on 11. There's lots and lots of what we call noise, things going on. And you could have a terrible weightlifting program or no weightlifting program and still win 16 games and win your state championship if you're flat out better than everybody else. So as you go through those examples, one of the things I'm hoping is, I'm hoping there's a bit of confusion. Well, what is the impact of a strength coach? Well, number one, our ability to make a difference, our ability to make an impact depends on qualities. And I give you some examples of what qualities are. Fat loss, hypertrophy, cardio, power, flexibility, agility, balance, skill, size, leverage, tactics, strategy, joint mobility, and any other thing you can think of typing. 
That's a lot of qualities. Some sports, let's use discus throwing again. It's your discus throwing technique and it's you getting stronger slash more powerful. And that's about it. Those are the two qualities for discus throwing. Besides what the person shows up with their inherited DNA. So it took me a few years to work on this. There's two things and I put them on an axis. The first is the number of qualities that the athlete needs for a particular sport or whatever uh, goal. Uh, some, very, very few qualities needed. Some, a lot. And then the other axis is what I call the relationship to the absolute maximum of each quality. So when you're talking about a sport like uh, powerlifting, where the if you deadlift 600, you're a... a you're 60% or less of the world record. Those numbers are pretty high. So the absolute max in the powerlifting is way up here. The strength levels you need to be an American football player, a rugby player, a discus thrower are going to be way down here. When you're talking about the 100 meters, uh, what elite is, is such a narrow band of humans who can do it. It changes everything. So... When I slapped out those two things, I came up with this very simple way to look at it. These are the four quadrants. It's very simple. Quadrant one is basically what little kids do. It's physical education class. Lots and lots and lots of qualities. You're gonna learn the rules of a bunch of sports, what out of bounds means, how to dribble, how to kick, how to throw, how to cover the base, how to touch, play tag, do all kinds of things. The level? Well, the level's really low. Uh, don't ever think you're great if you win your uh, high school PE class basketball tournament, as I proudly did back my sophomore year. Quadrant two, lots and lots and lots of qualities at a fairly high level. This would be collision sports and collision occupations. It's rare air. Quadrant three is where most of us are. Uh, the fat loss client is here. The uh, senior trying to get in good shape is here. And interesting, track and field is here. A few qualities at a reasonable, repeatable level. And then there's quadrant four. One or two qualities at the highest levels humans can perform. Let's look at each a little bit closer. So quadrant one is, is basically lots of stuff. Uh, this is when you should learn your calisthenics, your, your body weight exercises. Two important ones I have here, bike riding and swimming. The time to learn how to ride a bike is when you're little. So if you fall off, you don't get broken. The time to learn how to swim, of course, there's many old stories about this, is before the boat starts sinking. I also include games and sports. So if you come to my house for the Super Bowl, you don't ask how many is that. Uh, you should learn basic first aid, which I think is very important when you live in community. Basic survival skills, and I include them here. Stay dry, stay warm, hug a tree, that kind of stuff. Tumbling, which I'm a huge believer, and fall training, which I'm a hu huge believer. Because after a certain age, the most dangerous thing in your life becomes the floor. And learning how to deal with that makes you safer. Um, I also talk to my students nowadays about urban awareness. I'm always very afraid when I see people walking around streets like this. There are bad people out there and you gotta keep your eyes open. Uh, learn how to take the bus, for example, and learn how to recognize situations to get out of. And of course, I can't help myself, but this is when you should learn great and good books. Quadrant two is a little bit different. Quadrant two is amazing, even at the lowest levels. The strength levels of a typical high school football player are probably higher than most people who ever meet in your life. I'll go online and I'll listen to these people brag about this or that. And actually what's going on is that's a typical afternoon with an American high school football team. Mostly it's collision sports and collision occupations. And there's two important things I add right here and make sure you hear it. It's what most people think you should do. You should train like you're getting ready for fall double sessions in American football. You should train like you're going to get ready to go on the Ranger program. It isn't what you should do. I'm going to toss in a little extra freebie right here. When I work with people in Quadrant 2, 
after about age 22, and this is a hard thing for people to get hold of, if you're an American football player and you're 22, 23, and you're still in the sport, you're either at the highest levels of Division I or you're a professional athlete. You should know all this stuff. And once you've been in Q2, since probably your junior high years, it's time to shuttle down into Quadrant 3. You should consciously think of yourself as, this is football and this is the weight room. In the same way I would have a discus thrower think, this is the discus throw and this is the weight room. Now, Quadrant 4, I mean, well, God bless you in Quadrant 4. It comes down to a couple of I mean, the 100 meters, um, you need absolute speed to be a 100 meter runner. And that's it. No one rolls things at you. No one elbows you. It's your lane and you go. Uh, you wait for a gun to go off and then you go as fast as you can. You don't have to hop on one foot. You don't have to do anything else. With the big deadlifts especially, uh, I, I don't necessarily like to include the other two power lifts in this discussion because of the uh, equipment and gear changes that have been going on. But when you're talking about massive deadlifts, that's absolute strength. Uh, I always use the, the great quote of Arnold uh, Andrew Carnegie uh, when he said famously, put all your eggs in one basket, then watch that basket very carefully. Quadrant four activities is one basket, speed, strength, and that's about it. Uh, the late Charlie Francis, when he gave that workshop here in Utah, the thing that kept resounding in my head as he spoke is he is only talking about the 100 meters. Someone would raise their hand and ask this other application, and he would talk about the 100 meters. That's rare air, and that's what quadrant four is. I've come up with a new way to look at it, just, just for clarity a little bit. So quadrant four would be this. You are an A-plus student in one field. Uh, you might not meet very many people who are true quadrant four people in your life. As I say here, you might meet one. Uh, I've had the opportunity to meet someone who was born to sprint years ago, but their career was like a mayfly. Uh, greatest high school runner of all time, junior college runner, goodbye. But this person was put on earth to run. Uh, let's slide down to uh, the slide over to quadrant two. This is for the NHL, NFL, special ops. Basically, if you're in a collision sport or a collision occupation, there are like 50 classes you have to be a B student in. You don't have to be an A student in anything and you don't want to be a C student. You got to be solid across the line. You have to be very fast. You have to be very strong. You have to be very explosive. You have to be very, 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 all the way across on qualities all the way across on rules. Uh, you have to know how to put on the equipment. You have to understand the rules of the game. And there you go. Quadrant three, you're an A minus B plus student in two things. That's if you're an athlete. You're a, you have high jump technique and then you spend time in the weight room. That's basically it. When I, uh, when I talk about everybody else down there in quadrant three, this is your fat loss client. This is your, your senior. Um, you want to be passing in a couple of things. For example, you want a passing grade is how to shop, uh, how to prepare meals, how to cook, how to store meals, uh, how to show up at the gym, how to get your workout in, how to get a good night's sleep. You don't have to be the world's best at any of those, but you have to be pretty good at those. And then, of course, uh, in quadrant one, uh, the best thing you could do for youth is, I wish we had a wonderful... Uh, aptitude test that we could run everybody through so we could kind of sit down with little Billy and say, Billy, you're going to be the greatest kayaker the world's ever seen. You're born to kayak. And little Sydney, Sydney, you're the greatest cross-country ski racer the world's ever seen. And sadly, we're not there yet, but I'd sure like to see that happen. So, a good strength coach can be seen by answering this kind of question right here. The impact of your training, one, should be clear. When I coach you for your goal in the correct quadrant, the impact should be obvious and clear. 
It should put you on the path to your goals. And it should help you bring you to your goals. Let's go back. Remember, a coach is a carriage pulled by a horse or whatever. And it's going to take you from here to there. Good strength coaching takes you from here to there. It, the impact should be clear to the athlete, to the technical and uh, strategic coaching staffs, and probably even the fans. So one other little way I teach this now that's kind of fun. Uh, now I tell uh, people that quadrant four is the hand of God. Okay, um, basically it's genetics and geography. Uh, if you are born uh, a fast twitch monster and you are from Jamaica where the, the national sport is sprinting, there's a good chance you're going to be a pretty good sprinter. If you're a fast twitch monster and you are born in Bulgaria, uh, China, you might end up being an Olympic lifter. Quadrant two, you know, that guy's his head's getting knocked off. Uh, quadrant two, everybody wants to play in the NFL. Nobody wants to get their helmet knocked off. Quadrant one is physical education and fun. And then there's my favorite, quadrant three. Listen, those of you listening, you are probably in quadrant three, okay? I break out for my purposes in assessment, quadrant three into two sides. What I call active athletes, quadrant three, A squared. Originally, by the way, just for reference, I called them aging athletes because every day past 21, as in, that's horrible to hear, every day past 21, 22 as an athlete, you are now aging. And that's got to break your heart a little bit. And then I refer to the bulk of the population, 99.9, .9, as what we call everybody else. And that's quadrant three, Q3, E squared. Let's go into a little bit of depth on here. Now, quadrant two, A squared. Basically, I try to teach this idea that we work as a coaching staff in a yin and yang kind of thing. Um, you need to do the fundamental human movements. You need to get stronger, but then you need to do your sport. Um, my friend Bill Witt has a great way of talking about uh, when you don't have both sides built up, very often, by the way, when I was young, everybody did a lot of throwing, jumping, throwing, jumping hurdles, and almost no strength training at all except for calisthenics. So a lot of them had a what we call a flat tire. Now, once uh, track and field started taking on lifting, the uh, results exploded very quickly. Interesting, in now, many of our athletes, especially at the uh, teenage levels, weight lift five days a week, and they are huge on the weightlifting side, but they do very, very little sports practice. Shrinking both down is going to make a bigger circle for them. Uh, one of the things I always tell people, and this is just a little reminder for you, our job as a strength coach is to address weaknesses or gaps, but we also have to make sure we teach to compete with our strengths. That's a, that's a million dollar lesson. We attack our gaps, we attack our weaknesses, but don't forget, it's a phrase in American football, dance with the girl who brung you. You gotta make sure you focus on that, on, on your strengths. If you're fast twitch, you gotta be, you know, go fast. If you're long levers, use those levers. Whatever advantages you have, you must use them. Uh, quadrant three, where are the champions roam? This is a bit of a joke, but we don't do much and we don't do it very well. I, I make that point at workshops sometimes and everyone gets a little chuckle. Oh, you're so funny. But one of the things you have to understand is when we're talking about elite training, you have to understand what weak is to an elite discus thrower. These numbers come from Tom Fahey, who did an extensive study of international level discus throwers. And he found out that the minimum to be good is a 400 bench, a 450 back squat, very light, 250 snatch, very light, and a 300 clean. And of course, you need outstanding technique, um, great ability to deal with your arousal, raise it or lower it, great ability to raise and lower your tension levels. But you look at those numbers, and, I, and when, you, when you sit down with a group of elite throwers and say, that's all you need to do, they'll laugh at you and say, I did, I did that, and I, that 
And then the follow-up question is, then why aren't you an international level thrower? Well, because they have technical issues, they can't control their arousal, they can't control their tension. So as a strength coach, I think we can help all three of those areas, and, and even technique in some cases. Generally, I like to focus on two things in the weight room. First, let's have some kind of standards in our sport. Now, maybe your sport doesn't have any standards. Well, one thing I've been researching, and really if you work hard enough, you can find standards for almost every sport. Uh, I have standards for the high jump, the long jump, the pole vault, all the throws. Uh, the ones from the, the sprinting, hurdling aren't as clear to me, and other, some other sports aren't as clear. But you can get a ballpark number. Uh, on the men's side, almost traditionally, it's a 200-pound snatch, 90 kilo, 300-pound clean, 130, 140-kilo clean, and a 400-pound squat, uh, 180, 190-squat, kilo squat. Those numbers just keep showing up and showing up on the elite male side. On the female side, we're still working on those simple numbers. I hope we'll get there soon. But the other thing is gaps. What are you not doing? And generally, I find it's the deep, authentic squat and the lack of loaded carries. But what's also amazing is I have found some programs that do a lot of squatting, but they don't do any hinging. So push, pull, hinge, squat, loaded carry. You got to make sure they're doing those. And then, of course, you find the other gaps, the recovery gap. You know, only five hours of sleep at night versus eight or nine. Our job is, are you up to standard and what are your gaps? And then every other quality comes from the practice of that sport. Now, as we're going for the goal, there's a couple of things I want you to think about here. First, cut the number of options down. Uh, this is a big one in track and field. You don't have to do everything. You don't have to have this fear of missing out. Uh, just because those guys are doing it doesn't mean you need to do it. Keep trimming away your program until you find the fundamentals, the essence of, of performance in your sport. If, if you're working, if you're not working with athletes, there's still a lesson there. Um, I mean, it's, it's a bit of a cliche and whether it's true or not, but for fat loss, we say eat less, work out more. Eat less, work out more. I mean, that's the essence of it. Now, if it's true or not, some people will argue, but that's at least the foundational essence. Um, since you're going to focus on the big work, I always tell people, get off my back, gomb, get off my back. If my athletes got stronger and it only took them 15 minutes to work out, as the head coach, you can't get in my face. Well, their workouts are short. You told me to get them stronger. You told me to have them throw farther. I got that done. Yeah, but their their workouts are short. Well, their work that's okay. And this takes us right back to coaching 101. Always focus on the process. The results will take care of themselves. Focus on the process. The results take care of themselves. And of course, I make the little joke there. And of course, if you can finish the goal. Now, even if you're not. Uh, an athlete, don't ignore the lessons that we've learned in sports. Uh, one of them, the interesting things is this tightness from travel we get with our athletes. You know, very often when you fly in, well, I used to make the joke, we fly in planes like this, but nowadays you fly in planes like this. Um, so your hip flexors get very tight, you lose your T-spine, and you tend to lose rotary stability. So after a long plane flight, stretch out those hip flexors, Maybe do a little work on your, your mobility of your, 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 well, your whole spinal column, what hurt you do every joint in your body, and maybe a few bird dogs to uh, remind yourself about rotary stability. Number two, this is a great thing in life. Uh, uh, great athletes have the ability to actively relax. When you're a parent and your kid loses their um, brains, and it's nice to be able to go and just relax on cue. Um, this one here, heck. Lifting weights can improve performance. Yeah, I'm that guy that people still ask to move the couch because, you know, when you lift weights, you're a good couch mover. Um, Wilt Chamberlain famously told me at a track meet after I warmed up 
poorly but competed really well, he said to me, warm-ups is warm-ups. And the idea, one of the things you learn about from athletes is you sometimes it's go time. You just don't have time to do your 35-minute foam rolling, your 20 minutes of mobility. You got to go. When your baby vomits on your chest, you can't go warm up. It's time to go. And really, truly, um, this is not, this is from an upcoming lecture. I love the term with my athletes, can you go? Uh, a lot of us find millions of excuses to not get going. My only way I assess athletes is the three words, can you go? Now, there's two ways to look at what I'm about to say, and I think they're both right. Dr. George Sheehan famously said, being fit is one thing, being an athlete is another. Fitness is the ability to do work, and I applaud that. Being an athlete is different. Uh, being an athlete is something quite different. Fitness is what you pass through on the way to superior physical and mental and spiritual state. Well, hats off to you, uh, Dr. Sheehan, because that's a lovely thing. But I also have to agree, well, it's okay to have two concepts in your mind at the same time, what Phil Maffetone famously said, everybody is an athlete. So I love the idea of looking at every person who comes into my world as an athlete. The word athlete means one who strives for a prize. And I think we're all striving for prizes. As we start to loop around, I have a big concern about the strength and conditioning community. I feel like in the last 30 years, we've been crushing uh, strength and conditioning. And this isn't a rip on American football or special forces or powerlifting. But I have been with many powerlifters who will look at a game and say, I'll tell you one thing. If I coached those guys, they'd be stronger. Being stronger doesn't always mean you're going to be a better baseball player, basketball player, cricket player. It means that your loads in the weight room are higher. So sometimes the powerlifting influence has been a numbers-driven game, which doesn't help every athlete. And of course, American football and special forces, especially here in the States, uh, this idea of all kinds of this, you know, you do all these things to exhaustion, and then of course you drink your overpriced little magic juice that will you know make you instantly recover um, I think we have to run screaming from that idea when I look at training especially collision sports collision occupations I always get it down to this important little point hammer and stone comes with dr. Stuart Gill the uh, McGill the great uh, Canadian back specialist and it's his idea of you know, like when I hit the ground on a jump, that's the hammer. And my body responds, uh, laws of Newton's laws of physics. If I'm locked down here, when I drive that foot in the ground, I pop up and my head hits the basketball ring, rim. That's hammer and stone. Of course, in track and field, we've always used the concept of bow and arrow. When I look at elite athletes, one of the first questions I ask is, what kind of stone training do they need? What kind of body training do, do they need? Well, when I look at stone training, I break it into three parts. Let's start with arrow. Arrow is turning yourself into a missile. Uh, a good exercise for that would be the deadlift. I turn myself into a missile when I do the bow and arrow in the throw. Uh, my left leg blocks, my left side blocks. I turn myself into a uh, I, I turn that offside into an arrow and the implement snaps off into the field. Anaconda training is an odd one. This is that internal bicycle pump pressure that you get as you, you fill your body up. If you're an offensive lineman in American football and you have to stop somebody with one hand, it's not a tricep extension. You need to lock everything down. When you're throwing the hammer a long ways, if you lose your anaconda strength, the ball shortens up and you'll probably end up on your face. Armor training is teaching the athlete external armor, turning yourself into an armor-plated machine. Uh, I do this with tumbling and in certain exercises that actually have the bells hit you. For example, double kettlebell cleans, double kettlebell front squats seem to give a bit of resilience to the skin. 
not every sport needs all of it. When you look at something like Olympic lifting, sprinting, powerlifting, you probably need probably some anaconda strength, absolutely, probably some arrow strength, but you don't need it all. When you look at American football, collision occupations, rugby, you need all three of them. When you tackle somebody, you turn yourself into an arrow. When you push and pull against someone, you need anaconda strength. And if they keep pushing you in the face, you need some resilience, literally, in your skin and tissues. Uh, down there in quadrant three with that Highland Gamer, you need to be technically proficient and strong. And of course, in quadrant one, not all this applies. There should be some training of it. There should be some some general fundamental touches on it, but it shouldn't be a, a decisive part of your training. When I look at hammer and stone, bow and arrow, um, let me just share with you the most basic exercises you can do. So to build the hammer, boom, 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 hill sprints, stadium steps, sleds, prowlers, double kettlebell jerks in some cases, uh, rack deadlifts, these build these build that those legs that boom 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 those, it, that's the hammer to build the bow i find that the olympic lifts teach that bow and arrow as good as anything i've ever seen in my life and the swings are marvelous uh so to build the bow and arrow you still just stick with swing uh, kettlebell swings in the olympic lifts to build the stone we'll come back to this again uh the anaconda strength uh, bear hug carries with either heavy loads or other human beings. Goblet squats at the bottom position doing curls. Uh, I always joke with my athletes. I say, you know how I got my guns and then I show them this exercise. But as that weight moves away, your body has to counter it with anaconda strength. And then uh, goblet squats with heartbeats is when I sit in the bottom position and I just pump it out the weight like that. Again, it builds anaconda strength. I mentioned this before, armor building, that's double kettlebell cleans, double kettlebell front squats, and the amazing family of tumbling, which uh, not only is probably the best conditioner for collision sports and collision occupations, but it's also a marvelous thing long-term for allowing yourself to be resilient if you fall. You fall, you bounce, and you get back up. And then finally, for arrow training, I like planks and deadlifts. So what I've just given you is a wonderful buffet of exercises and that you can look at these and pick and choose which ones you like, right? Yes. However, make sure the exercises that you pick fits the quadrants that you're working with. As much as I like a lot of these exercises, and yeah, if you coach rugby or American football, all of it's good. But if you coach discus throwers, you would look at that and go, hmm, bear hug carries, hill sprints, rack deadlifts, Olympic lifts. Hmm. If you're working with, uh, you know, 12-year-olds, uh, you might go, yeah, I should guess I should teach them all of this at a low level and just expose them to it. If you're working with um, uh, an elite uh, deadlifter, you might look at a few of those and say, yeah, off-season, off-season, off-season off-season, pre-season, and that's all you might even look at. If you're working the elite sprinters, you might go, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen in my life, and sweep your hand. So that's the introduction to the quadrants.